March 16th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, John chapter 7 from the New Testament. After this, Jesus traveled throughout Galilee. He stayed out of Judea because the Jewish leaders wanted to kill him. Now the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near. So Jesus' brothers advised him, Leave here and go to Judea, so your disciples may see your miracles that you are performing. For no one who seeks to make a reputation for himself does anything in secret. If you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his own brothers believed in him. So Jesus replied, My time has not yet arrived, but you are ready at any opportunity. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I am testifying about it that its deeds are evil. You go up to the feast yourselves. I am not going up to this feast because my time has not fully arrived. When he had said this, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then Jesus himself also went up, not openly, but in secret. So the Jewish leaders were looking for him at the feast, asking, Where is he? There was a lot of grumbling about him among the crowds. Some were saying, He is a good man, but others, he deceives the common people. However, no one spoke openly about him for fear of the Jewish leaders. When the feast was half over, Jesus went up to the temple courts and began to teach. Then the Jewish leaders were astonished and said, How does this man know so much when he has never had formal instruction? So Jesus replied, My teaching is not from me, but from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do God's will, he will know about my teaching whether it is from God or whether I speak from my own authority. The person who speaks on his own authority desires to receive honor for himself. The one who desires the honor of the one who sent him is a man of integrity, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Hasn't Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why do you want to kill me? The crowd answered, You're possessed by a demon. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I performed one miracle, and you are all amazed. However, because Moses gave you the practice of circumcision, not that it came from Moses, but from the forefathers, you circumcise a male child on the Sabbath. But if a male child is circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses is not broken, why are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to external appearance, but judge with proper judgment. Then some of the residents of Jerusalem begin to say, Isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Yet here he is speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. Do the rulers really know that this man is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. Whenever the Christ comes, no one will know where he comes from. Then Jesus, while teaching in the temple courts, cried out, You both know me and know where I come from, and I have not come on my own initiative. But the one who sent me is true. You do not know him. But I know him because I have come from him and he sent me. So then they tried to seize Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. Yet many of the crowd believed in him and said, Whenever the Christ comes, he won't perform more miraculous signs than this man did, will he? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things about Jesus. So the chief priest and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Then Jesus said, I will be with you for only a little while longer, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. Then the Jewish leaders said to one another, Where is he going to go that we cannot find him? He is not going to go to the Jewish people dispersed among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What did he mean by saying, You will look for me, but will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? On the last day of the feast, the greatest day, Jesus stood up and shouted, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink, as the scripture says, from within him will flow the rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were going to receive, for the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the crowd began to say, This really is the prophet. 
Others said, this is the Christ. But still others said, no, for the Christ doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Don't the scriptures say that the Christ is a descendant of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? So there was a division in the crowd because of Jesus. Some of them wanting to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Then the officers returned to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why didn't you bring him back with you? The officers replied, No one ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered, You haven't been deceived too, have you? None of the rulers or the Pharisees have believed in him, have they? But this rabble who do not know the law are accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before and who was one of the rulers, said, Our law doesn't condemn a man unless it first hears from him and learns what he is doing, does it? They replied, You aren't from Galilee too, are you? Investigate carefully and you will see that no prophet comes from Galilee. And each one departed to his own house. God, I think it's amazing. Well, I think all your words are amazing. But I think it's amazing that when Jesus was talking to the Jewish leaders, he was pretty much telling them that they weren't saved and they weren't going to heaven. They didn't understand. They didn't understand a whole lot. But I kept going back through this passage and reading over and over and over again and doing some studying on it. And I just think it's so incredibly powerful that here these were people who believed in you, believed in God, um, religious people, we can call them religious people, religious people, studied the law, um, showed it off to everyone <laughs> by praying loudly in the streets and wearing their prayers on their, on their foreheads. What people of the day would consider religious people, and yet they don't get to spend eternity with you. Jesus said, where I am going, you cannot come. And I think in this day and age of the dilution of, of Christianity, we need to keep this in mind that first and foremost, our salvation is a gift from you. It is not something we can do in order to receive the amazing salvation that you sacrificed your son for. One of my favorite verses, well, I have a lot, but the one about salvation comes from uh, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, starting with verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And even earlier in this chapter, God, we see his brothers trying to get him to boast, trying to get him to do the miracles so that everyone can talk about it and everyone can see it, just like the the Jewish leaders. And I think it's a good lesson for, for those of us who call ourselves Christians and for others who call themselves Christians, that we've got to be really careful about what this looks to the outside world. If we truly are your children and we're trying to follow your path and it and it doesn't mean that we're not going to screw up and in my case screw up a lot but it does mean that day in and day out that that we're following your teachings that we're not boasting about what we have or what we don't have uh, we're not making it seem like we're incredibly pious or holier than thou that there's a humility about us just like there was in your son I think there's, there's also a huge warning in here for people who, who go to church on Sunday and live their life differently the other six days, who not only harm themselves, obviously, by the fact that they won't get to spend eternity with you, but also by the fact that when people look at Christians and they call us hypocrites, a lot of times they see those types of actions where people are like, yeah, I'm a Christian, I go to church, and, and then they're out doing all sorts of things that are not Christian-like behavior. I think that that harms the church incredibly, uh, much more so than non-Christians or people who, who don't say that they are Christians. God, today, I just, I just ask that we look towards your example of your son who didn't want people knowing him just by his miracles and 
He only wanted to be known as your son. He wanted them to know you. And what you had done, he reminded them quite often what you were currently doing in him and what you were going to be doing together. God, help us keep that in mind today as we go through life and and teach people about you and acknowledge ourselves or label ourselves as Christians that with it carries a lot of connotations with it, um, a lot of expectations, not just from the world, but most definitely from you as well. Help us to also realize how incredibly it is important, how incredibly important it is to understand what salvation truly means. Just the, the most important thing in the entire world that we've got to get right and secure our salvation with you. God, thank you for offering salvation to us. Thank you more than I'll be able to tell you for sacrificing your son for our forgiveness of our sins, for our salvation. Thank you for pursuing that relationship with us. I hope that my life in some small way reflects that thankfulness. That people can see past or at least forgive all of the hypocrisy I have in my life. And see the parts that are reflecting you, God. I hope that's the parts that they remember. In your son's name we pray. Amen.